Kia ora tato, good afternoon, and thank you very much indeed, uh, Matheson and uh, Matthew, for inviting me to participate in this. Uh, topic uh, I'm dealing with here is ab about um, uh, divestment of um, uh, fossil fuel, um, f from fossil fuel companies, um, because this is probably um, the most uh, inspired and practical and powerful idea that anyone's yet come up with about trying to um, really knock back um, CO2 emissions. And this was an idea that um, started to develop a couple of years ago by 350.org in the States, um, um, led by Bill McKibben. Um, and so it's about trying to um, do right, but doing well as a result. I want to... Um, just state the obvious that we have to purge fossil fuels from our economies for reasons of climate, social, and um, economic reasons as well. We don't yet have um, sufficient alternative to fossil fuels um, at scale um, or complete economic viability. But the faster we invest in those alternatives, the faster we will um, get to them. So what we need to do is to keep using fossil fuels for a while yet, um, but we have to drive big change um, on that switch. Now, it's really important to consider two parts to this that are very closely allied. It's about, first of all, being responsible consumers um, as we continue to use fossil fuels. So it's about, for example, minimizing the use with a very fuel-efficient car or taking public transport and the like. Uh, crucially, as consumers, we can also support those companies that might be helping on this. So, if you, if, given that we still need to buy petrol or diesel, it would be better to focus um, our purchase of that on one, the only one of those um, companies in New Zealand that has, and it's a very modest approach, um, to both energy efficiency, um, but also to um, investing in some um, biofuel uh, alternatives, which is Z Energy. And um, if we do that, we'd be better off economically. It's a way of keeping their feet to the fire whilst we still have to use fossil fuels. But the other part, which I'll now focus on for the rest of the presentation, is about being responsible investors. Um, so if we divest from fossil fuel companies, um, we are sending them a very powerful message. We are also um, starving them of capital, uh, which hopefully helps them change their ways and their strategies. Um, but at the same time, we might want to also be investors in Z Energy. So not just be customers, but trying to encourage them through investment. So you can um, go along to the um, AGM as a shareholder and help keep their feet to the fire, for example. And we'll be better off um, economically as a result. Now, I'm going to draw here on, on wonderful work from Carbon Tracker. Uh, which is um, a, a UK-based organization that has um, been driving the analysis of this, um, particularly around this concept of unburnable carbon. Um, and this, uh, the bigger frame there, um, is of um, their most recent report. It's a simple concept, which is that uh, there are so much oil, gas, and coal reserves already on the balance sheets of companies producing those fossil fuels. Um, and their stock market price reflects um, those very large reserves. There's only one problem. All those reserves can't be burnt. If they do, we fry. Um, and therefore, the current um, valuation of those companies is completely unrealistic. This is a, a big shock waiting to happen in stock markets. Um, so that's where the thrust for um, uh, divestment comes along. This is their work, um, and the four thermometers on the left-hand side are for a 50% probability of keeping the temperature down to 1.5 or 2 or 2.5, um, and the other four are an 80% probability. As you'll see, the red bar there is the temperature, um, and then on the same uh, thermometer, the little bit of grey on top is how much more carbon could be burnt if we were going to keep the temperature there. So, Call that the carbon budget that we have to play with. As you see, uh, if we were to do 1.5, which is probably unrealistic, we're well on the way to pass two, uh, it's a tiny bit of carbon. And even if we go out to three, um, which is, um, from an ecosystem point of view, is a dangerous place to be, um, there's not a lot of carbon to burn there um, before you get to three. However, we want to have a real shot at this, not a 50% shot, and therefore we're 
we, it's best to focus on the right-hand side. Well, we've blown past 1.5 already, so forget that. But again, come back to three. That's not a, a great deal of carbon um, left to, to, that we can um, um, burn um, in this, um, that long-term future, um, 2050 all the way out to 2100. Now, let's go back to 50%. Um, the um, green bubble there is how much um, fossil fuel can be built, uh, burnt, and then the purple is for, for, for 1.5, and then the purple's 2, uh, the gray is 2.5, and 3 is the orange circle. So they're all quite tightly gr grouped. Um, what the next circle out is the existing reserves on the proven reserves, exploitable reserves, on the balance sheets of fossil fuel companies. Um, it's um, way more than twice that carbon budget. Um, and the blue circle, the very big circle, is where we expect their reserves to be in decades to come. And, and I'm going to step you through some of the economics as to why, if we don't change anything, that's where we're going. So we need to think about that longer term blue, which is the reserves they're going to end up with, and that we want to be somewhere around about, um, hopefully, the, the purple circle in there or, uh, or the gray one. But that's only 50%. If we go on to 80%, um, you see that those, um, that carbon budget shrinks right back and is an even smaller proportion of the reserves now and the reserves um, in the future. Now, this is why on current um, models, um, those reserves will keep accumulating. Um, a lot of money goes into fossil fuel companies. There's about um, $1.27 trillion of US debt and about $4 trillion of equity. The companies then produce about uh, a, billion, a trillion dollars of profits each year. That's the $9.27 billion. Um, and um, only a little bit of that, of that comes back to the investors. Um, $126 billion in dividends and um, $27 billion in interest payments. Almost all the rest of that profit they make, they recycle into capital expenditure, $674 billion, to develop more reserves. So that, that's the mad roller coaster that we're on. Um, and as I say, those profits spur more production, and very little of that actually comes back um, to the investors. Just to put a little bit of um, perspective around that fossil fuel impact, um, and, and where it sits in a global stock market context. If you look at um, the market value of all the fossil fuel companies in the world, they're only, in total, add up to about 7 to 8% of the value of all the stock market shares in the world. Um, and Carbon Track has been, um, keeps its eye on the 200 largest fossil fuel companies, 100 coal, 100 oil and gas. And those 200 have a market um, value of about $4 trillion, uh, and they're carrying about $1.5 billion, a trillion dollars of, of debt. Analysis by HSBC, which is a global bank, uh, they are not just a high street bank like here, but an investment bank as well, um, suggests that if the value of those companies was downward adjusted to reflect um, how little of their reserves could be um, burnt, if we're to meet any of those temperature targets, um, the value of those companies would fall by between 40 and 60%. So in other words, if you're sitting on shares in those companies, um, you're sitting on a very risky share. Um, some investors would say, well, we'll just stay here until we can see the exit signs and then we're out of here. But we know what happens in the stock markets. It's very much a herd instinct. Um, once everybody starts heading for the exits, there is a complete collapse and nobody gets out. Um, so that's not a strategy. Um, and so that's on the share side. Um, but again, when you substantially disrupt the economics of this, then it means that those companies then can't pay their interest bills. And therefore, they would, their debt would be downgraded by people like Standard & Poor's. So that's the, the sort of economic uh, and investment impact we're juggling with. Now, just to show you what's been happening with the investment patterns of these companies, um, I've worked out this chart, which is not quite as complicated as it looks. Um, 
uh, red's bad and green's good. So that's essentially what it amounts to. Um, what I've got is three major stock market indexes from MSCI, Morgan Stanley Capital International. One is energy shares, one is all shares, and then the bottom one is um, called ESG, it's Environment Social Governance, and that's one of the sustainability frameworks. It's not the most rigorous, but it's one of the most widely used. Then across the top, we've got a 10-year return and five, three, two, and one, and um, where a box is green, it means that those shares have outperformed the rest. So if we look back 10 years, that was a great spike in energy prices, um, particularly in 2006 and 7, before the global financial crisis. Um, and uh, indeed, um, those energy shares outperformed all shares um, and the ones that had a sustainability focus, the other two indices. But the global financial crisis changed an awful lot, and technology has changed an awful lot. So as much as you might like or not like fracking, fracking in the US has created a huge gas glut, which has destroyed the value of gas companies, um, and it's displaced a lot of coal, for example, in US power stations, um, and therefore forced down the price of coal globally. So in the last five years, these fossil fuel companies, their investments have performed very badly. So that's why they're in red, and that's where you see they have underperformed or shares, or the sustainability shares. And the one that I like best is, of course, the bottom line. That's the ESG. Those are sustainability companies. And um, you can see how the returns, particularly this last year, have been um, pretty spectacular. MSCI, um, a few weeks ago, did a very interesting piece of analysis to try to replicate in their indices the work of um, uh, the global tracker stuff. And, um, it's hard to see there, uh, this is the wonderful point, is that there is a blue line and a red line, but they basically track each other since 2008. And um, the blue line um, is um, world stocks minus fossil fuels, and the red is world stocks including fossil fuels. And you see they almost perfectly track um, when you t look at them in aggregate. However, when you look at them in rather more detail, the non-fossil fuel group of stocks outperformed those with fossil fuels by 1.2%. So in other words, you would have been a smart investment manager if you had no fossil fuels in your investment portfolio over the last five years. So yes, this is a moral issue. Yes, this is a science and climate and everything else issue. Um, and I feel I'm passionate about all that. Um, but the plain economics of this um, is what um, the most immoral, um, unscientific, unsocially just person in the world should be able to respond to as well. Now, bringing this to a New Zealand context, um, the best work in New Zealand has been done by WWF New Zealand, and they've produced two reports so far. The first one is to look at how much subsidies the government gives to fossil fuels, and that's the headlines down the right-hand side. Uh, that's just oil and gas. Um, and you see that over the last um, uh, four or five years, that's ramped up considerably. Most of that spend by the government um, is doing seismic work um, in our oceans um, to try to encourage um, multinationals to come here and explore for oil and gas. That's the bulk of that money that the government spent. There is also some various tax write-offs um, to the benefit of the oil and gas companies. Um, that's not a lot of money, um, but it's the government's small effort to um, try to swing the argument back the other way towards oil and gas. But think of this from a major international company's point of view. Um, exploring for deep offshore oil and gas here is incredibly difficult. It is right on the outer edge of existing technology um, and, and also fraught with difficulties. Um, so Deepwater Horizon in the Gulf of Mexico was an exploration well that went horribly wrong and about, took about 6,000 ships to clean it up and two relief drill wells, drill rigs. So if we had a serious accident offshore, where would we get the two relief drill rigs from? And where would we get 6,000 ships to clean up the mess? And it's out in the ocean, so the mess would get away from us more than it did in the Gulf of Mexico. 
So these companies are not stupid. They're prepared to play a little in this game, go along with the government, but when they're sitting on so much oil reserves elsewhere in the world, why would they want to take um, this big investment gamble in New Zealand? The second report that they've just done is on our New Zealand superannuation fund and ACC. Now, you might be surprised that ACC is one of our largest investors. The reason is that it looks after a lot of people with very long-term health and disability issues, and therefore it relies on its investment income for, to look after those people long-term. So it's a very major investor, it's a very good investor. Um, and um, so as you can see, the superannuation fund, that's, that's that there, has about 6.5% of its uh, shares in fossil fuels, which is, mirrors the global market. And, um, uh, ACC is a little bit heavier uh, on, on uh, or fossil fuel shares. But equities are only part of their in total investment portfolio. Um, they've got land, they've got um, non-stock market listed stuff, they've got bonds, they've got commodities, you know, they invest in property, you name it. So fossil fuels is only a very small part of their um, 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 investment portfolio. The response of both organizations so far to this work from WWF has been a bit disingenuous. The superannuation fund has said, look, sorry, this is my interpretation of their words. I think it's a fair interpretation. Um, we are the professional investors. We know what we're doing. We are signed up to all these sustainability-related watchdogs, which indeed they are, um, and so we will do the right thing. It's been quite a patronizing response. It begs a number of questions, not the least of which is, although they're signed up for those organizations and those protocol, um, how active are they um, in um, being at the forefront of those organizations to really um, put on, you know, drive on on those issues? However, the pressure is building elsewhere. So um, taking the lead from um, 350 in the US, um, 350.org.nz um, uh, is also pushing uh, hard on uh, fossil-free New Zealand, um, as is Generation Zero. Generation Zero has just had a, a 14 city and town tour of New Zealand around this issue, very, very focused on incredibly practical solutions and things we can do to move away from fossil fuels. Um, so um, it's wonderful that the Anglican Church, starting here in the Auckland Diocese, and we hope that this will um, spread through the other dioceses in the country and then on to General Synod next year, um, can really make a, a stand on this too, because the Anglican Church is an investor to pay clergy, you know, part of Matthew's pension um, at the moment is in fossil fuels. Um, and um, not well what will eventually be your pension. Um, so um, the Anglican Church, um, I'm not rushing you. Uh, um, the Anglican Church um, uh, is a moderate sized investor in New Zealand terms, and therefore it's right that we as Anglicans um, can at least start to try and get um, um, our house um, in order. Um, and it's one of my favorite quotes of all time. Um, here we go. Uh, you'll have no future if you don't make one for yourself. Thanks very much indeed.